Hello there, I'm Marian Ellis, and my company, Cape Insights, has made the seven-part series of conversations with crackerjack speakers to give you a taste of things uniquely South African on a voyage of discovery that unpacks our creativity, diversity, heritage, and history. You'll hear from dream weavers and luminaries about what makes the country captivating and compelling. And on this visual journey that covers a variety of options from art to zebras, fossils to food foraging, colonization to creativity, you'll be shown aspects of South Africa's vibrant landscape, resilience, sociability, and breathtaking natural beauty that we hope will entice you to venture south and experience it for yourself. This is a learning journey. Join us as we all seek with new eyes. Welcome, time permits. So today, the speakers will show you aspects of what makes South Africa creative and its artistic forces unstoppable. Now, that one word was selected by the Southern Guild gallery owner, Trevon McGowan, to best describe South Africa's creative spirit in our first session. And I think it's a wonderful word. So what makes South Africa's creative and artistic forces unstoppable? Hand-picked trailblazers will show products that are both art and craft, and then we're talking about initiatives that spark hope and why and how. So this is a learning journey for us all. Welcome aboard. A Halstead is the heart and the vision behind Ardmore. She's South Africa's most successful ceramics, and it is South Africa's most successful ceramic studio. Imaginative, vibrant, and dramatic are some hallmarks of the objet d'art prized by collectors, galleries, and museums throughout the world. Set on a remote farm in the rolling hillsides of the Lower Drakensberg in rural KwaZulu-Natal, Ardmore is where more than 50 artists draw on their Zulu traditions, folklore, history, and nature for inspiration to create handcrafted and highly detailed figurative works and functional wear. It's where Faye's partnership with Bonnie and Charlie Shali brought their combined talent to the attention of art critics and collectors alike. Their work broke the mold of ceramic conventions. No traditional techniques were used. Fire terracotta clay was painted with placa paints, boot polish and oven blackeners. They developed their style by pure ingenuity thrift and chance. Recently, of late, Faye's been diversifying Ardmore's much sought after ceramic creativity into a new visual language. So you'll get a sneak peek, the very first, to see ranges of fabric, tableware and wallpaper design, as well as a textile range of silk scarves from Hermé, no less. Irrespective of the medium, Faye continues to nurture and to guide every person, oversee every piece, cajole and support every individual whose life is tied to Ardmore. I give you the indomitable Faye and the creative Ardmore. You're first going to see a brief uh, video on Ardmore and then Faye's going to speak to you. The story of Ardmore Ceramics begins at a farm at the foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains, when two remarkable women from different worlds came together to forge their collective inspiration through art to tell unique and important South African stories. Hi everybody, I'm Faye Halstead and I'm the creator and founder of Ardmore Ceramics. And uh, this is our museum and where it all began. Come on inside and I'll show you. So it all started in 1985, and it started with a young lady called Bonnie and Chalanchali, 
and she and I started working together in the Drakensberg, in the Champagne Valley area. And we started by just making molded ducks, which we hand painted. And then we moved on into stories about Zulu culture and history. Storytelling is a big part of Zulu culture, as well as working with clay. The Zulu people would make fabulous okumba pots and the herd boys would sculpt little clay animals, farm animals from river clay as they attended to their dad's cattle. And in the beginning, we never had big kilns or glazes, so the work was painted with paints. And as you can see today, we've evolved into these magnificent use of glass, which is glazed and colors, which comes from the traditional Arab beads, the love of the Arab beads and the color that was lacking from the natural dyes and clay pots fired in a wood firing. I personally have an incredible love for the fauna and flora of Africa and the conservation of animals. I'm passionate about animals. And to work with people who have that same closeness to nature, living in symbiosis with nature, they use animals so much with hidden meaning. And that's why you'll see animals and plants in our work. From 1998 into the 2000s, we started losing a lot of artists from HIV AIDS. In fact, sadly, Bonnie was one and Wonder Boy and Kamala. And the artists took this up on their own. It was stigma to it. They didn't really want to talk about it, but they started making incredible works. The works on HIV AIDS have traveled the world. A lot of the work was done by Wonder Boy in Kamala, and he writes and he talks about AIDS. An incredible collection of work of which I'm incredibly proud. Here we see George Magnatella, and he's creating a vase. He's our master thrower and he's going to take another throne form and join all that together. And then what happens is some of the sculptors who you see here, take his forms and they sprig on sculptors. So here, this is a secretary bird with snakes and it becomes a teapot. Each work is unique. Another artist, Tulani, has taken the coil form and he's built from the bottom up this amazing vase, which has ended up in this beautiful font with rhinos and zebras, and so the imagination goes. This is totally an idea of Tulani's, and he's known for these incredible vessels. Once the clay work is dry, we then take the pieces, put them in the kiln, fire them to 900 degrees, and they come out with no moisture in them, solid, and we call that bisque, and that's ready for painting. In here, I've got a special surprise for you. There is the most incredible lockdown pangolin that's come out of Ligeton. It was created by Tobojo and Tlovo. We've done a stone finish to this fabulous protection pangolin. Wiseman has painted the tortoiseshell pattern here because the tortoise also locks down and protects itself in its shell. So here you've got this whole symbolic story of lockdown. The piece that was made here in our gallery was this chandelier. It was made by 25 of our artists. It is the biggest collaboration I've ever seen at Ardmore. It is called the Kings of Africa Chandelier. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Well, that was her showing you her spot in KwaZulu-Natal. And now she's going to show you more and expand on this really exciting diversification tangent that she and her team are embarking upon. Hey. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you, Marion, for having me. Um, we've had the most wonderful year, funnily enough. I feel like I've been on sabbatical and I've thoroughly enjoyed working with the artists. I'm just going to give you a snippet of some of the new things we've done. This was a fun thing that happened in Ligeton. Mantler had made himself a mask 
from scrap um, bits of material. And I said to the kids, come on, let's do masks. And they ended up on UK uh, Fashion Week and UK Vogue, and then on the New York Fashion Week. So from a little idea to New York, I think that's quite something. And uh, we've really been doing all sorts of new things and all inspired by things that happen to us. So these little monkeys, these nonsense monkeys that always run and play down at the bottom of our river, are the artists have put them in our masks. And we're very proud that these masks, uh, the pr proceeds, have been feeding our community in the village. And uh, we, we're so delighted that that has met with such success. This was a guy called Seasware, and instead of painting, he was bootlegging. And this is the barrow of booze. And of course, we weren't allowed to smoke and drink, so it's a little bit of fun. And artist Bennett Zondo created this wonderful piece. And uh, Wiseman and Poofy, he actually painted it, one of my favorite works. We couldn't drink. We were all bootlegging and finding a bottle here and coasters and then stoppers because, boy, did we have to savor our wine. We were having sips every night and the stopper had I to I think what we should do, since there is a connectivity problem, I believe, in the rolling hills of KwaZulu-Natal, is that our technical team are going to run, am I right? They're going to run through my, uh, Faye's presentation slide-wise, because there's some gorgeous sneak peeks. And I'm going to very briefly talk and go on from the bottle stoppers, which they did very cleverly. Um, and we're just going to run on with them quite quickly. The candle holders Faye talked about, but it's the next products that we're also showing more of this diversification of their cushion range, their tea towels, these are the gorgeous tea towels, a whole Christmas tableware setting range that you can um, delight in from every um, texture upwards and onwards in your hands and on your eyes. They're lovely wallpapers, which they're developing, which are extraordinary. And I think some, yes, this is just a, a further in-depth, very naive, wonderful glimpse of all the animals in in Eden. And then this amazing story of their, of their designs being taken up by Herme and put onto silk scarves, no less, and they can clad your shoulders. And Herme was so successful that, Dax, are you looking? This, this is what you can do with your surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a designer Herme surfboard, did you know? Right. So, I mean, there's that too. Um, and I think that's another lovely Herme silk scarf design. And the last picture or one of the pictures coming up, yes, it's a gorgeous close-up of how they can really share their Zulu folklore with the world. And very soon, I think we're going to have a picture of them some of these wonderful, amazing creative artists at Ardmore in Natal. On behalf of Faye, who couldn't be with us to end this. Um, so let's go on to our very, very different person of the night, Stradom van der Merwe. Now, Stradom is a land artist. And that's not to trip off the tongue for the average person in terms of definition. So I looked it up and this is what it says. Land art is a form of contemporary art known also as earthworks or earth art. It's an artistic movement that emerged in America in the 1960s when a number of sculptors and painters determined to heighten public awareness of man's relationship with the natural world by intervening in the landscape in a series of thought-provoking constructions. And thought-provoking Stradom's works are. So the underlying aim of this novel type of visual art is to create artistic imagery using natural material with a view to increasing our sensibility towards the environment. Land art is closely related to conceptual art. 
in that the planning and photo documentation of the creative process are often exhibited in a gallery context, even if the work itself is located elsewhere or vanishes ephemerally. So Stradon is a land artist who's exhibited and been commissioned across the globe with work featuring in many collections and galleries. He's modest, but he's global. He reckons that visual recording is always what we're left with, but that it should remind us of the experience, the journey of making the art. Unlike other artists who create preconceived art, he says it's only when he's immersed in nature that ideas and techniques for creating the art take shape in his mind. And he recognizes the fragility of beauty and what it means to the big environmental picture. So let him show you what he does and where he'll take us. Hey, straight on. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Yes, yes. This, um, this first image is, is, is a wonderful example of, of the ephemeral kind of work that I do. So there's this early morning, the dew on the grass, and I, I took a broom um, from the kitchen and, and I clear the dew and I give a big jump and I clear the dew again. And by about 11, 11.30 in the morning, um, there, there was no sign that I've actually made this artwork. So what is really wonderful, and I think that, that came across in, in your wonderful introduction, thank you, was that um, you can't really sit in your studio in your house and think what you're going to do, because nature actually tells you what is possible and what to do. And the only way to found that is to go for a walk in nature and to see what is happening at that moment in nature. So it's a kind of improvisation of the moment what is happening with you and your communication with nature and as you go along. So this is also a, a beautiful example of, of working at the Nyrox Foundation, the cradle of humankind, did a residency there and, um, and there was lots of these reeds and I picked some of the reeds and, and I make these ladders, but it's, it's seven, seven step ladders. So I was interested by the idea that, that you, it, there's seven steps to talk to your forefathers or seven steps for your forefathers to talk to us down on earth. So a symbolic meaning be behind the work, but wonderful reflection that you get in the water. So how nature plays its part in producing this work, which is really nice. I think what, 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 what's wonderful ab about these works is, is the, the moment that you make the work. And I think that's really difficult to bring it across when you exhibit in a gallery, is, is that feeling that you have an artist have while creating this work. And, and this is a, a wonderful example of Long Beach close to Cape Town, just walking the beach and see those wonderful rocks and then get those seaweed and weave them around the rocks by the beautiful colors that went with it. And, and, and in the next slide, the, the, the same kind of idea again, where you got these, where I always thought, you know, stones are so heavy, they're always underneath the water surface and how wonderful it would be for them maybe to float above the water and why not? And, and so I, I, I picked some, some sticks from a forest nearby, put it into the water and just simply lift the stones and balancing them on the sticks. And, and this work lasted only about for 30 seconds or 25 seconds or for the while that I have to take the documentation of the work. But again, look at the wonderful reflections in the water. And um, the next slide is, is almost the same as, as, as the slide that I started with. And that was, you know, you go for a walk in nature and, and you see these beautiful flowers that falls from the tree. And in that specific image, it's from a jacaranda tree. And I, I realized, well, there's, there's a possibility that I could do something um, with this. And um, yes, went back to my house, quickly fetched the broom, drove back to this parking area, and then start to clear the circle. But look how wonderful the, the, the lines from the parking area starts to play its part in this work, which you didn't realize not before you clean the circle. So it's, it's an impromptu work that's happening at that moment and that's developing as you're busy making the work, which, which I find, find really exciting, I think, for an artist. And I think that's why it's easy maybe to, to walk away from the work as an artist. 
and you and you experience that moment that will never happen again. But obviously, you have to take photos or documentation to show what you've done. I think in, in, in the next works, one, one will also see uh, more examples of, of, of the kind of work that, that I can't really, as I said, sit down and think what I will do. This is a walk um, in, near, near Graaf Renet, and the farmers have lifted the wire from the fences so that the animals could roam freely between the farms. And I took a walk this late afternoon and I pick up one of these bundles of wire and I just balance it on top of the stone. And immediately it looks like a drawing, you know, a child drawing, a line drawing of a cloud. And, and I thought that's absolutely amazing because isn't the Karoo a place where you wish for more rain and where the farmers wish for more rain? And what more wonderful than a child line drawing of a cloud against this beautiful blue background of the Karoo. And that inspired me to a whole lot of new work and eventually an exhibition that happened in Johannesburg and so on. But I think what, what eventually happened with you as an artist when you, when you work in the landscape is you, you became aware of how the landscape is constantly changing. I mean, you, you, you're busy working on the beach or you're busy working in the forest or you're busy working somewhere else. And you realize that there's different kinds of color of soil to be found. Stones isn't just stones anymore. Stones have texture and color to them. And then I was commissioned by Wines of South Africa to create a work for them to show the different kinds of, of, of um, terroir that one would find in the wine industry, especially in the Western Cape. And I simply went to lots of different wine farms and I collected some of the soil that these vineyards, these wines are, are grown in, and I put them in these crisscross lines to create this work, this, this working together to create this, this wonderful terroir of the wine industry of the Western Cape, of which South Africa is, is really well known by tourists overseas. But as, as, as I mentioned, I think if, if you work in the landscape, the, there's no other way of becoming aware of how nature is changing and what is happening about global warming and desertification. And I think if, if you're really a true artist, you've got a voice and, you, and you've got to make a statement, and then it comes true in your art as well. And this is done in the Tankwa Karoo, which was once well known as, as a wetland area. And I collected some of the black sand far in the, in, in, in the distance, and I just draw those ripple lines across those black stones that, that you see there. And it looks as if it's this ripple of water across the landscape. The idea that there once was water, but there's actually no water at the moment. And that inspired me to carry on with this and you get commissions from, 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 the, from the next slide is a, is a good example of a commission from the United Nations for an exhibition about global warming. And I went to the nearest hardware store and I bought this drainage cover and I put it in the Tankwa Karoo and, and took this documentation, a photo, um, the idea of desertification and how things are changing. But making these kind of work, you, you, you wish that you can bring it across to people, that people can actually more see it. And, and, and I got this wonderful opportunity when there was a weekend organized for the leading CEOs of businesses in South Africa. And on the last Sunday afternoon, they asked me to give a workshop. After that, this whole week of lectures, this whole weekend of lectures to give a workshop. And I decided that each one of the CEOs would get a small square of about two meter by two meter. And I gave them a little picture of lines and they had to draw that as if it's like a kind of sand castle. So nobody was actually knowing what they did, but when they were finished and you move back and you could see the whole image, it was the idea of, of a fingerprint. What, what is our fingerprint? What is your fingerprint of CEOs of big companies in South Africa? What do you leave behind for the new generation? to follow and, and, and what is the purpose of your business in helping all these things that's happening to the earth, et cetera. And, that, and, and, and I think that was one of the first works on a large scale and then, and then I was excited to get commissions. And, and the next is a wonderful wine farm um, in Stellenbosch on the Hellswurte mountain by the name of Bartony. And they commissioned me to, to do a work, which is their logo, 
which is which they call the elevage. So the elevage is a French term for for enlightenment or the enlightenment of grapes. And and what we did is we we took the logo and and on a vineyard area of about three thousand square meters, a year in advance we we collected. 45,000 different plant species from the mountain. We started to grow them and eventually after a year when the time was right, we planted them. And what we did with the logo and the idea with the logo was as the seasons would change, vineyards change, wine change, nature change, it's part of cycles. Then the logo would appear and as it becomes winter, the logo would disappear, or in summer, the logo would appear. So it happens, it depends on what time you would drive over the Hellswurter mountain, and you could see this logo at a certain time of the year. The logo wasn't there. So, a wonderful example of the changing cycles of season and of the wine industry of how things is in a constant change of happening. Which, 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 I, which was very excited, which, which commissioned for, for the next really great work, which which, which was wonderful for the University of Stellenbosch, the Faculty of Agri-Science, and they asked me to do something for the 100-year anniversary. And I thought myself, while growing up, up on a farm, and you think about agri-science, you think about working the land. And I thought, I have to do a work which is about working the land. And what is agriculture about? It's about plowing, sowing, eventually harvesting. And what we did, is we planted a circle with a cross with canola. So I did my research, long research, and I found the oldest symbol for the earth is a circle with a cross in. So we picked a perfect spot along the N2, the important road between Cape Town and the garden route, and we planted two of these circles in canola among the wheat field. And then obviously we know that as things would change, the canola would start to get into bloom and the yellow would become stronger and stronger and stronger until at a certain point, which was absolutely this perfect yellow two circles that you could see across the N2 highway, which was absolutely stunning. But then we know, and I think this is part of land art and, my, and part of your introduction, the kind of work that I do is part of the cycles of nature, part of the cycles of life. And we knew that that would change and eventually the yellow would change into the brown and would eventually die. And aren't we just part of the cycles as human beings, as the cycles of life and the cycles of nature? And that's what makes this kind of art form so exciting. Thank you, Marian. Thank you. That's super. Gosh, well, just I've always been completely inspired by the Bartony Angel because it's in such an easy and accessible part of um, our winelands. And so when I go over that amazing mountain pass called Hilshoogta, I always tell my clients to look out for it. I delight in their products. And um, it brings me enormous delight. I just want you to know that. So I'm looking at the screen to see what the questions are that are coming up. Uh, there's a comment <laughs> to know nature, botany and art so well from Colleen. Thank you. Yes. Uh, but the question, which is actually <laughs> one of the questions is, how do you make your money out of this? <laughs> yes. Yeah. What, 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 what do I sell? You know, what, what do you as a client get eventually? What do you put up? Now, now I, I, I think that there's two kind of, of ways. So one is obviously the, the photo documentation of the work and you get advertising agencies and companies that, that, that buy the right to use some of those images for a certain advertisement, logo, brochure, or things like that. So one, one, one of my biggest clients is, is, is the biggest law firm in South Africa. So they use, so you get clients that use these images as part of their corporate identity. But then um, many of the images that I show were commissioned work. So you, you were commissioned by Bartony, you were commissioned by the University of Stellenbosch, you were commissioned by the organizers of the leading CEOs of South Africa, and with that obviously come an artist fee. So the time that you spend doing the work, so it, it's like creating a work for a special event, being commissioned and asked to, to create an experience for people that lasts for a week 
or for a moment or for a month or for a year or it has happened before create an experience for people that lasts for 10 minutes so it i think one have to think differently it's not about permanency it it's about the experience that people find when they look at the work and what they left behind in their mind that they carry with them for the rest of their lives mm. okay and then on a completely different tangent somebody said how did you get into land art <laughs> yes yes well i um i i obviously asked the question myself many times you know it it, it it's not not such a well known um art form in south africa and but but there are many artists that are doing it and there's there's lots of young people picking up doing it which is which is very exciting but but i think to start up i i grew up on a farm as 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 a young boy and i don't and i think you don't have the privilege to play with many friends maybe as children that grow up um uh, in town you know so you have to find ways of keeping yourself busy in the forest along the river and i always think you know you when you see a wonderful rock or or something eventually you pick it up and you look what's going on underneath so you you spend more time studying nature in your whole afternoon before you have to go back for supper or before it's dark maybe then other kids would do and i and and i think that that was sort of the birthplace and and then eventually i went to study art and and the main things that you learn is is color perspective balance and then you realize all those things are in nature mm-hmm. and and why not use nature to do those things but then i i had to get my mind across the idea and to come back to your first question maybe i'm busy here making something that's not permanent and 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 i i i remember the first kind of works that that i did was with bricks that i put in lines of of over chairs and over tables and things like that and and when i came back in the afternoon it was moved and it was displaced somewhere else and then i realized you know i i have to take a documentation to show what i've done and when i took the documentation i realized well that's enough to show what i've done it doesn't have to have to last for long and 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 i think that's how i got it and then obviously lecture saw what i did and then the 1960s the, the birth of plant art in america and then it ran over to europe um, I'm, i'm not alone there's many artists and many other artists doing it and and that's an inspiration to what you do and then i, th- I think eventually you used to start to think well i have to find a, a africa signature to my work that is different from other land artists that work in other parts of europe america or asia and that's constantly part of my thinking process but now apropos that there's a question because you were so modest about what you've done saying and you must answer this have you gone to any other countries to do this earth art <laughs> yes i yes i i think about 20 28 29 different countries been to so it's like they invite you and and it's wonderful they 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 enjoy what they see the kind of work where they do then the invitation is come across to our country you don't have to tell us what you're going to do we believe that what you're going to do is what we've seen what you've done in the past and with that we are very happy so we realize that when you come here you're going to take a walk in the landscape or you're going to take a walk on a mountain and you're going to create new works but I, but i think what's wonderful from those commissions is i think the, the the people that invite you they are interested in in how does somebody from south africa experience a landscape in switzerland or well, an experience yes that's right and obviously it's different you know i i i i remember i i i organized an event in south africa for many artists that, that came and work in south africa and and those long thorn bushes you know those with what we call kameel doerings the artists were fascinated by that and they start to make the most beautiful artworks out of that and i've seen that many times in my life but i haven't done anything about it and sometimes you need somebody else with fresh eyes to come and show you the beauty of a landscape or things that's happening around you 
Okay. And one quick last question. Are there any new, are there new young land artists coming into practice in South Africa? Okay. Yes, there are. There, there are many. I, um, but let me on, on answer it in a different way. Well, William Kentridge have done fantastic land art works. He's not, so, he's not um, new or young. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but, but I think many people miss that. But no, they, 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 they are young artists, make beautiful work. And I think that that's because the realization that, that, that it's part of the curriculum at schools and universities, even if it's just a small introduction, maybe what we're doing tonight, but people became aware that there is an art form like that. And, and there, there's, there's many young people, so I get lots of emails and questions from young students who wants to learn more and wants to know more. And, and that's exciting because they are a new generation. I'm part of an old generation and they will look in a different way of the South African landscape that I've been doing all these years. Lovely, Stradom. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Now we're going on to something completely different, but as exciting in a, in, a, in a vitally energetic, different way. So Mungo is a family owned weaving mill that creates heirloom quality products and it has deep roots. Founded by master weaver Stuart Holding, his designer daughter Tessa and son Dax, who's the current MD, they work with a team of over 80 people in the scenic coastal town of Plettenberg Bay, where the Mungo Mill is as much an architectural landmark as a thriving hub and a transparent showcase of production. Mungo's byline is quality fabric woven with integrity. The team believes strongly that what they create and how they create it will filter down to the end user and help to improve the world we live in. As part of their traceability objective, they are very particular about sourcing quality natural fibers. Another element in what underpins Mango's trading philosophy is that when people understand where something comes from and how it's made, they make more conscious purchasing decisions and they value their purchase more. I certainly treasure my purchases from them and I delight in giving these as gifts since they're so easy to pack. Hence, noted friends overseas. <laughs> Dax will elaborate on his family's foundational values, Mungo's community involvement and Mungo's environmental commitment. I hope you're as inspired as we are by their handiwork and their ethos. Here's watching a wee video and then listening to Dax.
right. This is Dex, mm -hmm. the second generation. <laughs> and that beautiful little girl was the third generation, his daughter, just so you know. Dax. Thank you, Marianne. I have to say that video always gives me, gets me a little bit emotional for some reason. Um, welcome to everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so Mango really starts way back in the Industrial Revolution and this environment that was created by that in terms of specifically textiles, that was harsh, um, wasn't safe, children would work in it, sometimes it was almost fatal. It was bringing people away from their homes, um, the cottage industry, and putting them into these buildings where we'd produce things on a mass scale. And I think that's kind of, Mango sits in between that and the arts and crafts movement. Um, my father, he uh, did his apprenticeship uh, in the, in the uh, silk mills, mills in Lancashire in the 60s. And that was sort of when the, the, the Industrial Revolution was coming to an end. Um, he did his seven-year apprenticeship and uh, he had a choice between staying in the mills the rest of his life and I think it was sort of time for the hippies and he rebelled and he decided he was going to travel. travel. Um, he came to South Africa and he got involved with some artists and crafters and uh, he started to learn the weaving process from the, the hand weaving, spinning side of things, completely uh, a complete antithesis to the, the industrial environment that he'd, he'd learned. And over the years that, that formed how he produced textiles. Um, he went away from this economy of scale, uh, compromising on quality, compromising on, 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 uh, on design, simply to make something that was uh, uh, more profitable. So, you know, Mango has become a family business and it's, become, it's come off of the passion that he's had for that. And um, my sister's involved now, she's, and myself, uh, we run the company and my father still is involved, but uh, he, he likes to fish a lot more. In fact, he's off fishing at the moment. Um, but we have this beautiful legacy to take it forward into the future. We produce all our textiles in a, in a place called Plettenberg Bay in the Garden Route, a very beautiful place. Lots of tourists come down here. And we've opened up our production facility for uh, the public to come and see, touch, feel, smell, and hear um, how a product is actually made. And we feel that this brings people closer to the, the process. Obviously, it brings them closer to the process, but we feel make, it, it, it gives them a stronger connection to the product. And in that way, they value that product more. And in that way, it sort of becomes more sustainable. It becomes that, that heirloom product that they want to keep. Um, they start to see, see the story behind it. They start to experience um, the value of it. So um, we as a company, we obviously, it's the buzzword CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. We have our, our, our MOVE um, initiative that we, that we run. It's, it's very much a part of our values to give back to the community. Um, what we do every single year is we, we bring the children from the local community uh, down to old, to old Mekamanga and uh, we teach them the, the, the process of designing the kokoi, how to uh, match the colors, how to get the proportions of the stripe right. And we then put that kokoi onto one of our modern day looms and uh, weave off a number of units, which we then sell and uh, the proceeds go to the uh, paying for a teacher um, for their school. In that way, we kind of create a circular process of them actually contributing towards uh, paying for their own education. Um, this is a random slide about uh, the, the space that we live in. Um, this is uh, well, my father on the right and my brother-in-law on the left, off to go and pick some mussels for dinner. Um, I'd love to say we do that all the time, but we are very busy working, so it's not every single day. Um, but that's a testament to the sort of space that we work in. So going forward, the future of our company, um, I'm moving it into a direction which is 
in line with what we feel our responsibility is towards the planet and how we would like to see other companies producing a product. So we're now the first uh, GOT certified organic uh, manufacturer in the country. Um, we're producing our, a number of our products with uh, GOT certified uh, cotton um, in a hope to sort of promote uh, and show that a company can produce products um, with organic cotton and that it's not this sort of rarefied product that not everybody can afford or, or, or access. Uh, we we're hoping to become B Corp um, certified as well. And that's part of our journey to become a business that can actually make some change. And we feel that that's, well, I feel that that's um, very important in terms of how the future of the world is going to look and how my daughter, for instance, is going to, what kind of a world she's going to live in. And uh, excuse me, that's my alarm going off. Um, so this is really where, 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 where Mungo comes to its, its, its uh, and everything that my family have done have comes to its sort of pinnacle is how can we as a business uh, make a change in the world and how can we shape business to make that change? It's much like what Stratum was saying about the fingerprint and the, 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 the impact that business has on the world and, and what is it that we can do. We can't leave it to governments. We can't leave it to, to um corporations, big corporations, you know, they're there to make the money. We've got to do it through our values and, and through our passions. And, and that's what I hope to leave, um, leave the planet uh, having done is just feeling like I've made a bit of a difference. So it's an amazing journey and I really can't wait to see what's next. Mm. Thank you. Gosh, gosh. Well, I've got a question that's popped up as I thought it might, because I may, did make mention of it in our in our briefing. What does mango mean? Question mark. <laughs> Man, mango does it is mean a, something. It, does it have a meaning? Yes, it does have a meaning. Um, my yeah, that rebel that 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 rebel that I was talking about, that guy who my father, um, he. Uh, he actually, um, mango, the term, the term mango is the same as the term shoddy. I don't know if you know the term shoddy, but shoddy was uh, the rag and bone men's of old would come around and, and pick up, you know, the old textiles and they would be taken back to a factory where they'd literally be ripped up and the fiber would be reconstituted into what is referred to as shoddy or an inferior um, fiber. Um, and mango is another term for that. So um, it's a bit of a joke, really, the fact that we produce it world-class uh, premium products, but it's, it's called Mungo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't see any other questions about that at the moment. Anybody got a question for Dax? Come on, type it up in the box. Mm -hmm. Type, type, type. A bit about your beautiful building, question mark. There's somebody who's got a very graphic eye on these things, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so we we have outgrew ourselves, and, and we don't want to be in an industrial in an industrial space um, to produce what we do. It's we want to be out of that industrial environment. So um, we and we own the property that the mill is on. Um, so we're in the fortunate position to be able to to build um, our own mill when we when we outgrew um, a space that we had been renting previously. And uh, we uh, commissioned, interestingly enough, um, a local land artist um, who uh, designed this building for us, and particularly that skin off of an image that he had captured in the mill of the warp and the weft. Um, so the, that skin, what we refer to as the skin, or that wooden slatting, is, is, is representative of the, of the warp of a, of a piece of fabric. And um, the rest of the building is takes its inspiration from the textile mills of uh, Northern England, which uh, would have been face brick and there would have been um, uh, usually a river running past for a wheel to drive the looms. Um, and so we have that reflecting pond and, um, and then obviously, you, and as you go into the building, you can, you can walk behind that skin and then look into um, the production facility and, and see that 
whole and be a part of that whole experience. So it's not just looking at the at the at the production, but it's also the shadows, the shapes. The it's a it's 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 art. He's an artist. He wasn't an architect. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then there isn't a question, but there's a lovely statement or by, from Colleen saying, to run and grow a family business is a challenge. Doing it in a way to change the world is an incredible challenge. And it has an exclamation mark at the end of it. So I want to thank you and to, to end with that, because I think that that's a gorgeous statement on all our okay, behalf. guys, now I'm going to bring you all together in the last few minutes. And I want to talk about this Proust question that I want to put to you. And the reason why we've taken this, this, this idea is that the quote that we hold as a company close to our hearts is, a real voyage of discovery consists not only in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So this got us to putting this Proust style question to you. And it's actually a parlor game um, originated by the French novelist who believed that in answering the question, an individual reveals his or her true nature. So the question that I'm going to ask you, Dax, since you're on screen is, what creative quote do you personally live by? Uh, I think to be brave and to be bold and not to fear failure. Mm. Do you know who said it? No. You just hold it close to your heart. <laughs> Which is really, really lovely. Okay. And Monsieur Stradom in Stellenbosch, what creative quote have you taken to that you that you think of that that just gives your you an extra impetus? Yeah. I'll hear it from you. Yeah, I, I I I think what what works for me the, the the most part of my life is 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 do what I believe in and what I enjoy the most, and that will eventually be your success. But never start makes work to impress other people or start make to in work to get somewhere in an effort to achieve something. But rather just make something that firstly that you enjoy as an artist. Mm -hmm tremendously mm. and it will eventually get recognition somewhere along the line mm. interesting mm. thank you thank you thank you guys really appreciate that so now we i'm going to give you guys the, the viewers a sneak peek into what's next um and our our, our next session and what the archaeologists hold and this really is quite something so you're going to explore big history major events on the road of our cultural evolution to becoming human you're going to trace why south africa can claim to be the cradle of life we're going to track where human origins began by revealing evidence and ancestral milestones in the cradle of humankind you're going to connect the concepts of fossil and first people or first nation with the San, one of the last hunter-gatherer societies on earth. And who's going to be speaking to you about this are some serious paleo geo heavyweights. John Compton, who's got a, a PhD from Harvard, and he's author of the book Human Origins, which we're going to cross-reference quite a lot. Professor John Parkinson who's an emeritus professor at the University of Cape Town. He's also a fellow of the Royal College. And Howard Geach, who's a specialist guide with a number of strings to his bow, who's going to open your eyes literally to the prehistory, the density of the prehistory in the cradle. So three amazing interpreters in this archaeological landscape is where we're going to take you in two weeks time and all three of them will delve really deeply to satisfy your curiosity about where you come from and they'll surface tantalizing evidence to show you how you've got here so join us you've just had a glimpse of aspects of south african landscapes and heard 
from some local personalities of note. And there are more, all thought-provoking, stimulating, eye-catching. So please join us on our other learning journeys. If you venture south, or better still, when you venture south, you'll get more than a taste of our delectable food and our award-winning wines. We'll show you over a variety of our landscapes on one of our small group tours designed for curious travelers that delve deeply into the same niches you're seeing in the series. These are a mere taster, just so you know. We thought an appropriate way to end would be to share a salutation in Kosa, which is one of our 11 official languages, and it means go well or stay well. So, with our thanks and good wishes, Hamba Gashle.